morning. Christ is able. Everybody should know this well by now. Come ye sinners for a needy. Come ye proved it's weak and poor. There's a harbor for the broken where the homeless are restored. Come ye Joseph, pray for God to bless your warm drink souls my rest. Bless your heart. He's able to take care of our needs. Absolutely. A couple other people. He woke us up. He's able to keep us going every day. Absolutely. Someone else. He protected us. From He's able to give us peace. Absolutely. What else? Christ is in control. Christ protects us. One person over here. Yes, Miss Linda. Christ is able to forgive us. Amen. So whatever and wherever you may be this morning, Know that Christ is able. Let's sing this song one more time. That chorus one more time. He is able. He is able. Christ is able. standing for our first song this morning, hymn number 273, There Shall Be Showers of Blessings. Guys, if you can turn the screen on at the back, it'd be great. To be showers of blessing, this is a promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing, sin from the Savior above. the house of the Lord this morning. I trust that you've had a wonderful week, and it's always good to be in God's house to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We come this morning with many needs in our lives, in our nation, uh, in our world. We just ask that as we go to the Lord, God would answer and meet these needs. Uh, I'm reminded there are a number of folks in our church family that are sick and afflicted. We want to remember them. We were talking about the showers of blessings we plead for. We're such a blessed people, as we saw this week, the destruction 
that hit the Florida coast. Uh, just a storm blew up, and it was a, a quick storm, but it was the fourth strongest storm to ever hit the United States of America. Think about that, the fourth strongest to ever hit this country. We missed it. God is gracious. It tore up Florida. My son pastors in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, I talked with him last night. He said they were only having one service this morning. They had no electricity, and he's right in the heart of Greensboro. He, he said they had no electricity since Friday, and uh, they were having one service today without electricity and power. Hey, you don't have to have electricity and power to worship the Lord, do you? But I'm just saying, God has been so good to us. Uh, he blesses us in ways we don't even understand. And uh, we, um, um, we come together this morning to worship Him because certainly He is able and He is worthy. I want to just thank all of you for praying for me and Anita this week. Um, uh, she had surgery, as some of you know, most of you know, on Thursday, <laughs> and uh, did well. And I want to thank everybody that called or sent cards or brought food. Uh, man, y'all just, I'm honestly, y'all just have been so kind to us. And so thank you uh, for all the expressions of love that you have sent our way this week. She's doing well. She's progressing good. Didn't have to do it nearly as much as they anticipated. Um, and we praise the Lord for that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, Brother Billy. Whitlock, our chairman of deacons, and also deacon of the week this week is going to come and lead us as we worship him and we pray to him. If you'd like to join us at the altar this morning, uh, please do so at this time. Uh, I'd like to ask that you remember the Gilstrap family. Is, uh, they'll be having the funeral today for Denise Gilstrap. They'll be receiving friends at uh, 1 o'clock at the mortuary uptown, and the funeral will be at 3 o'clock. Also remember the Sewell family. Many times uh, we think about people in the moment of bereavement, but in the weeks and months to follow, they are still suffering, and they need us to always remember them and be thinking of them and add encouragement to them as they go through life without their mates and others in their family that uh, they have lost. So uh, please remember these families and any others that... Uh, you may not know about this morning. Uh, we have several sick people, uh, people that are suffering from ailments and other things in their lives, so please remember those also. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, we do lift up these families, Lord, that have lost loved ones. God, they're hurting, and God, we ask that you would just put your comforting hand about them, that you would give them a peace and comfort, Lord, as they go through these times as a family as friends, and Lord, we just ask that you'd be with them. Lord, there are many that uh, have physical needs. God, we lift them up to you. You know who they are, and you know what needs they have. And Lord, we just ask that you would provide healing according to your will. And Lord, we come to you, lifting up this service to you today. Lord, we pray for Pastor Wayne as he comes and speaks to us. Lord, we thank you for him and the blessing, God, that he has been to our church and we just thank you for that. Give you praise and glory, Lord, for the way he has uh, come in and filled in for us. And, Lord, we do lift up the pastor search committee as we strive, Lord, to find that man that you have out there for us. And, God, help we pray that you would just give us wisdom, knowledge, and discernment, Lord, as we search out that man. And, Lord, we pray that you would help us not to get ahead of you or behind you, but be right on time with you. Lord, as we come to the service this morning, the message, I pray, God, that you would help each of us to have open hearts and minds that we'll receive what you have for each of us. For these things I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our offertory hymn this morning is hymn number 393, Onward Christian Soldiers. Let's stand as we sing.
sing it, Lord. I thank you for the time that we had to come to spend together. Pray that you be with Pastor Wayne if he leads the message, Lord, if there's one also, let him be saved. Let him be with his tithes and offering. Bless the gift and giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles this morning to the second book of Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I invite you to stand with me in honor of reading the Word of God, 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse number 1. Paul was writing from prison sale to his dear friend and son in the ministry, Timothy, and this is what he charged him to do. He said, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman, or a farmer, that laboreth must be first partakers of the fruit, considering what I say, and the Lord giveth the understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. You may be seated as the choir comes to sing. Bye. 
I'm sorry, um, 2 Timothy chapter number 2, beginning with verse number 1. While the choir is making its way down, let me just say to those who visit with us this morning, thank you for coming. I know you could have come somewhere else to worship, but you chose to come here. And we're always delighted to have visitors at Eastside Baptist Church. And for those who watch us by way of uh, internet, uh, Thank you for tuning us in and for watching the broadcast today, and may God bless you as you watch us from wherever you may be. Last week, I was invited to preach in Spartanburg, South Carolina, at a school ministries uh, banquet, and there in that banquet, I talked to them about the fact that we have a reason to make Jesus Lord of our life. And that song that the choir just sang describes that reason, because I've been to Calvary. And that text in Colossians chapter number 1 teaches us that when we went to Calvary, we were born again, our sins were forgiven, our names were written in the Lamb's book of life, and we have a sure sure, uh, 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 way to to be in heaven uh, because of the blood of Jesus. But here's the thing I wanted to share with you out of that text in Colossians. It says that Jesus conveyed us. He redeemed us and conveyed us. And that's a word that means he picked us up here and took us over here and set us down somewhere else. We went to Calvary some years ago. We have testimony of knowing Christ. And because we're redeemed, we're born again, we're forgiven... Jesus then took us over here and sat us down somewhere else. You know where he sat us? In the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm grateful this morning for the church, aren't you? And I'm grateful that we have an opportunity to work in the church. I'm grateful for the fact the gospel is housed in the church. And if you're not a member of the church, you can be today. I'm telling you, every born-again, blood-washed Christian is a part of God's church. And here Paul was in a prison cell. He was over there in uh, Rome writing to his son in the faith. Now, he was not his blood son because we know that uh, that, uh, Timothy's uh, father was Greek and his mother was a Jew and we know that Paul went to the city where Timothy was and he met this young man on that first missionary journey and he began to mentor him. He saw something in that boy's life and he believed that God had his hand on Timothy and so Timothy became one of his his preacher boys. Wherever Paul went, Timothy went along with him and, and now Paul's over there in prison. Uh, doesn't know how much longer he has to live. And by the way, you and I don't know how much longer we have to live. It could be today. It could be a long time from now. But the Bible says this is appointed to a man wants to die. So here Paul is over there in Rome in a prison cell, and he writes this letter to his adopted son in the face, Timothy. And he says some things to him that I hope will help you and me this morning because I want to preach to you on this thought, the hats of a churchman. When I got saved, I didn't know anything about the church. I was ignorant of all sorts of things in the faith. But when I got saved, I soon learned that the church was important And it became a vital part of my life. Can you say amen to that? Folks, I'm grateful for the local church, aren't you? And so this morning, I want you to note with me that Paul 
is perhaps in the last place that you would expect to receive a letter of encouragement. He's in prison. Normally, you're trying to encourage that person that's in prison writing letters that way. But Paul was in prison writing a letter this way. He had peace with God. He had joy in his heart. He knew where his destiny was. And he was writing a letter of encouragement to his son in the faith, young Timothy. Now, he did several things in this letter. First, he was writing to assure Timothy of his love for him and his prayers for him. Here's the thing. Folks, I tell you what, you can pray to heaven from any place on earth. You can be in a living room, you can be in a church, you can be in a prison cell, or you can be in a host of other places. I'm so grateful that there's no place that's isolated from the prayer line to heaven. And so here, Paul was encouraging Timothy to remain strong in his salvation. And I want to stand here this morning, church, and encourage you, be strong in the Lord, be strong in your faith, be strong in the church. And he tells Timothy to take the things that he had heard and learned from the old preacher and to commit them to faithful men. Folks, I want to tell you today, you're not an island to yourself. When you're born again, God puts his word and love in your heart, and he wants us to take that love of God and express it to others and to commit it to faithful men. And so in this text today, Paul is writing to Timothy, one of his young men that he has influenced in the faith. This past week, I was sitting on my back porch. My wife was uh, sitting in a chair uh, getting over surgery, and I was on the back porch with my Bible and my notes, and I started reminiscing. Do you ever do that? I started reminiscing about the years in the ministry, starting back early in my life, and after the Lord called me, and I started writing names of preachers that had surrendered to preach uh, with influence in my ministry that we had sent out. And I got to 22, and uh, I then started counting about the number of pastors that's still pastoring today that are out there preaching the gospel this morning that I helped ordain and send out in the ministry. And you know, I rejoiced in those 18, but then I came to those four. And I remember there was one of them that died. Brother Dan Logan was one of my dearest friends on earth. And uh, I was privileged to ordain Dan after he graduated from Southwestern Seminary. And he went out to pastor and he got cancer. And I remember the day he came to my house and told me, he said, Preacher Wayne, I, I need you to pray for me. I got some bad news. And I remember those years that I prayed for Dan and Kathy and and uh, God took one of them home. One of them had a moral failure in his life, sadly. And man, my heart just, you know where I'm going. My heart just grieved. There was one that was no longer um, in, the, in the preaching ministry because uh, the devil threw him a curve and uh, he had a moral failure in his life. There was one <clears throat> that left the preaching ministry and the pastoral ministry for another ministry vocation. And then there was one, there was another uh, that, uh, that just dropped out of the ministry. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about? I began to reminisce. Well, Paul was in prison having one of those reminiscent-type uh, moments, and he was writing to Timothy, and he was sharing with Timothy, Timothy some things that he ought to do. And I want to share those things with you. I believe this is an encouraging message. It certainly was for me as I studied it. And I want to share with you this morning seven marks of a churchman, seven hats of a churchman. And it begins there in 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. And the first thing that Paul said to Timothy, he says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others. I want you to note with me here, the first thing we notice that Paul said that Timothy was, he said, you're a steward. You're a steward. 
And he said to Timothy that he was a steward of the face. Folks, I want to remind us today, because we've been to Calvary, we've been born again, God took us out of that world of sin, brought us over here, and planted us down in the church of the Lord Jesus, and he's made us a steward of the gospel, a steward of the face. Paul was reminding that God had given him stewardship. What did he do with this stewardship? First of all, be a steward of the gospel. That word there, committed, means to be deposited. The idea is that he was to take the things that he had heard, the things he had learned, the things that he had grown to know was truth, and deposit that into the lives of others. Now let me just sit down where you are, church member, this morning and remind us that we're a steward of the gospel and we learn. We go to church. We go to revivals. We go to Sunday school. We go to all sorts of places. You come here at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning and then Sunday night and then Wednesday night and we learn from the Word of God. Well, what are we to do with that? We're not to just hoard it up. Paul said, I've committed, I've deposited this into your life so that you can take what you've learned, heard, and know and deposit it into someone else's life. You say, preacher, where can I deposit that truth? Well, you begin with your family. Mamas and daddies need to deposit it into their children. Now, let me just tell you something here. And I could chase all sorts of rabbits But here's the thing, when I got saved, I began to love the church. As a teenager, I would go to revivals. I would go to any church gathering. I would go to church every Sunday morning, and and I, I I would listen to radio. I remember, I remember on Sunday afternoon, I would listen, Brother Dan Greer. Y'all remember that name? Oh, oh, Dan Greer. He preached every Sunday afternoon from Washington Avenue Baptist Church. And I, I love Brother Dan, and I'd, I'd listen to him. And there was Oliver B. Green. Y'all remember that name? Oh, Brother Green. Man, he would just shell the corn. He was an evangelist. Everywhere I could hear truth, I took it. I learned it. I loved it. Here's the thing. I believe God wants to take what we've learned and deposit it into others. And the one thing I've learned is that you ought to go to church. I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for a person's faith that doesn't go to church. I believe you ought to be in the house of God. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And I'm telling you, church, church is not just for senior adults. It's not for just middle-aged adults. There is no requirement that God gives to an adult that he doesn't give to a teenager and a child that has been saved. It bothers me that young people come by the droves and they make professions of faith, but they don't, it doesn't bring them to the house of God. I believe young people and teenagers and children and middle-agers and, and adult, senior adults, you ought to be in church. Because Jesus died for the local church. And Paul said here to Timothy that you ought to take what you've learned as a steward of the gospel and deposit it into others. Paul said in Romans 1 and verse number 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God until salvation. Folks, I'm telling you, he saves the young and he saves the old. And he and all those in between. And the Bible says here that we are stewards of the faith. And in verse number two, the word witness was referring to the many who had witnessed Paul's work. When I got saved at age 14, I wanted to learn as much as I could. And I knew the world wasn't going to teach me that. Did y'all know that? The world's not going to teach you about the truth of Jesus and the love of God. The world's not going to tell you how you ought to live that moral life and how you ought to serve others as you serve Jesus. You know where I learned that? I learned that in church. And so Paul wrote to Timothy and told him to be strong 
in his salvation, and it begins with stewardship. Well, let me go to the next half. He said, because you're not only a steward, but in verse number 3 and 4, he said, you ought to be a soldier. Now, everyone in this room has not been a soldier, but some of us have. Look there with me what he said. He said, therefore, bow therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He uses a metaphor here about the military. I remember those days when I was in the military. I went to Fort Polk, Louisiana, and as some people said, it was the armpit of the earth. I remember going through all of the stuff at Fort Polk. I remember going through those gas chambers, and I remember going through those POW camps. It was back during the tail end of the Vietnam War. Man, I'm telling you, they were tough on us. Why? It wasn't a gravy train. I thought I was an athlete in high school, played 10. I thought I was in good shape until I got to Fort Polk. It was hard. They made it that way for a purpose. And the reason they did it so that when you come out of here, you'll be a good soldier. They taught you how to, how to throw a hand grenade. I remember the day, first time I pulled that plug on that hand grenade. Now, I threw it a long ways. How many of you ever threw a hand grenade? Y'all know what I'm talking about, guys. I, they took you through all of those different things that you go through so that when you graduate, you would be a good soldier. Well, Paul said there in verse number 3, you need to endure the hardness of a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Did you know that you're going to go through some things as a Christian? And all of them are not pleasant. I'm telling you, you go through hardships and trials and tribulations and God walks through you with you through every one of them. A verse that has meant so much to me in the latter years of my life is Nahum 1.7. And it says this, God is good. He is a refuge in a time of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. Folks, I'm telling you, as a soldier of Jesus Christ, we go through things, but we don't go through them alone. And Paul was reminding young Timothy, that young man in the faith, that you have to endure hardness of a good soldier. Now, that word hardness means difficulties. Did you know that you may leave here today and walk into some of the most difficult things you've ever experienced in life? Some of you right now are going through some of the most difficult days of your life. You've experienced grief of a death of a loved one, the loss of a mate, divorce, I could go on and on. Some of you are going through some of the hardest things you've ever gone through. And it'd be easy to throw up your hands and say, Lord, why me? Why me? But I'm telling you today, it rains on the just and the unjust, the Word of God says. And Paul was reminding Timothy, yeah, you're going to be out there serving the Lord and you're going to run into some stuff. Now, I want to tell you, Christian friend, Tomorrow when you go to work, you know, you may run into some stuff. You may not experience on the job tomorrow the fellowship and the sweetness and the spirit that you experienced in Sunday school today. Paul was saying to young Timothy, when you go through that stuff, you need to endure it as a good soldier. And then he says in verse number 4, No man that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Paul here is continuing with that soldier metaphor. And he says, when you go out there in the fight, you don't get tangled up with other stuff. You keep focused on the main thing. 
He's saying here that a soldier is not to get entangled. How many of you have ever been fishing and you throw that rod and reel and all of a sudden it backlashes? Y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm not the only bad fisherman in this crowd, I know. That thing backlashes and that line gets tangled up. Or have you ever been uh, fishing and you catch a fish and it gets wrapped around something and tangled? That's the idea that Paul's giving here. When we're out there serving Jesus... We should be so focused on what we're doing for him that we don't have time to get tangled up in the affairs of this world. I'm telling you, the devil will set traps for you. The devil will come against you. He'll do everything he can to keep you from being faithful to the Lord. And Paul said to young Timothy, remember, remember, don't get tangled up in all this other stuff. I'm telling you the reason some church members are not as active and as faithful as they ought to be because they get tangled up in other things. And Paul is saying here, you're a soldier and and you ought to not get tangled up in the affairs of this world. And he goes on in verse number 10 in that tanglement, entanglement metaphor. And he says there, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Uh, What he's saying here, if you're a soldier of the cross, you need to think about the whole crowd, the whole church, the whole platoon. He's talking about their teamwork. And he's talking here, a soldier who thinks only of himself is disloyal and undependable. So Paul was saying to young Timothy, it's not just about you. Down in Central America and South America, there's a bird that's called the Mimi bird. It sits in the trees at night. The only thing it says is Mimi, me, 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 me. It's called the Mimi bird. I believe that church is lit in a lot of churches. That bird has lived in a lot of churches. Let me say that again. That bird has made its way to a lot of churches. Me, 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 me. Folks, it's not about me. It's about him, and through him we serve others. And Paul said we're a soldier of the cross. Well, there's a third hat he mentions here, and that is verse 5. He said we're a steward. We're a soldier. And then he says, we're a sportsman. Look there with me in verse number 5. He says, And if a man also strive for mastery, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Strive for masteries. And he's not crowned, except he does it by the rule. What he's talking about here is using an athletic terminology. What Paul often, by the way, used athletic terms. He talked about being a boxer. He uses terms like wrestling. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. He talked about running. He says, run the race that I've set before you. And on and on he goes. He uses often athletic terms. And here he's using that analogy. And he's using the athletic language to make a point. And he said, if I, if I strive in an event, I must do it by the rules. Look there with me again in verse number 5. Yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. There have been many athletes that have been disqualified because they broke the rules. I was watching a football game yesterday. And I saw um, a referee take that yellow flag out of his pocket, and he threw that thing a long ways. And he said, targeting, targeting. That is, there was a player coming across the field, defensive back hit him helmet to helmet, and he was charged with targeting. And the referee said, you're out of the game. He threw him off the field. He had to go through the tunnel and out of the stadium. He had been disqualified. Why? Because he broke the rules. Paul's using that very analogy to say to the soldier of the cross, 
You'll be out of the game if you break the rules. Here's the thing. I've watched and witnessed through the years many people that have been thrown out of the game because they damaged their testimony. Oh, they're not un- they're, they're, their name was not removed from heaven's book. You know what I'm saying. They didn't lose their salvation, but they lost their testimony. And here's what he's saying here. you got to obey the rules. Folks, I'm telling you, God has given us a standard, and if we're going to be a good soldier of the cross, if we're going to, <clears throat> if we're going to be a... If we're going to be in the race, then we must, first of all, obey the rules. And then he says in this text, we are to obey the rules and we are to compete. Look there with me again at verse number 5 and see that term that he's using to say to us. He says, and if any man strive, competes, if he pushes for the victory, He will not be crowned unless he strives lawfully. Folks, I appreciate competition, don't you? When I was was in the coaching realm, uh, I encouraged those athletes to do their best. I encouraged those athletes to give it their all. Why? Because you will never win if you don't give it your all. Ability was only take it so far. But you've got to decide you want to compete. And that's what Paul's talking here to Timothy about. Too many people just lackadaisically tries to walk through life in the Christian realm. But I'm telling you, there must be a focus. There must be a determination. You've got to abide by the rules of the Word of God. And then you've got to strive. You've got to work at it. And folks, you'll never be much for Jesus until you decide, I'm going to work at serving Him. Well, I could go on and on about the sportsman, but notice the fourth hat. He said, you're a steward. You're a soldier. You're a sportsman. Now, I just couldn't find an S for this word, but it's in verse number 6 and 7, he said, you are a farmer. The husbandman. That word husbandman means a farmer. That labor must be first partakers of the fruit. He says here, you're a farmer. Now here Paul compares the church work with cultivating a field. How many of you ever planted a garden or farmed or done it? Um, you remember you drop those seed in the ground in the spring. You may put some fertilizer on the rows. You wait for the rains to come from heaven. There's the lay-by time that you hoe and keep the weeds out, but you just wait on it to grow up. And then the time comes. Those tomatoes start turning red. That corn shop starts turning colors. You know it's ready. Those watermelons have a different sound to the thump. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It, there comes a time that it's ripe and it's ready to be picked. And then you go out and you cultivate it. You bring it in. Folks, that's a sweet time. And I remember when we were farming, uh, I would always enjoy the time the watermelons come in. And you know those watermelons, they have that big old heart in the middle. Y'all ever burst watermelon in the field? We didn't call them burst. We said busted watermelon. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And you reach in that thing and get that heart out. Man, there's nothing better. And the farmer gets the first fruit of the crop that comes in. That's what Paul is saying here to Timothy. Look at that verse again. He says there in verse number 6, The farmer, the husband that laboreth, must be first partakers of the fruit. Consider what I say, and the Lord giveth the understanding of all things. Two-fold application here is, The sower that has worked hard, enjoys the fruits first. And folks, I want to tell you, there's nobody happier in the Lord than when he sees the fruit come in as a Christian than that person that went out there and planted the seed. When you see a person walk down the aisle and they give their life to Christ, you've witnessed to them, you've prayed for them. There's nobody happier than the person that planted the seed. And we enjoy the first fruits of the crop. Folks, I want to tell you today, there's nothing like serving the Lord and seeing the harvest 
come in. No, Paul was saying to Timothy, you enjoy it. You sow the seed of patience. Because you've been out there laboring hard, you rejoice in the reaping. And folks, I'm telling you, there's nothing sweeter. But then in verse number 15, there is a fifth hat to a Christian. He talked about being a steward, being a soldier. He talked about um, being a, a, a farmer. He, he, here in verse number 15, he talks about being a scholar. He said there to Timothy in verse number 15, he said, study, study, study. Folks, I can't reiterate that word enough. You become a scholar of the things of God. You become a scholar of his word. He said, study to the show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm telling you as a believer of the Lord Jesus, we are scholars when we go to the word and we learn his word. Some people study it more and learn more than others. But what Paul is saying to young Timothy, if you're going to be effective in the Christian life, you need to study the word of God, not for your own benefit, but to show yourselves approved unto God. Folks, when you go out there and you share your testimony and when you live your life in front of others, it ought to be based on something. And what he's saying here is we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Oh, listen, I don't want to be ashamed before the Lord because of lack of studying the Word of God, because of lack of preparing well. Paul is saying to us, we need to be scholars of the Word. You say, preacher, I've never been a scholar of anything. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. We are scholars of the Word. When we've been saved and we get in the Word, and so Paul said to Timothy, you study the word and show yourselves approved unto God. And folks, I want to encourage you today to be a good scholar because it pleases God and it blesses others. You'll never know what it means to that son or daughter, that grandchild, when they set your feet or in your lap and you tell them stories about David and Goliath. When you tell them stories about Mephibosheth that was broken, but he was brought in and sat down at the king's table. When you tell them stories about old Paul being shipwrecked. When you tell them stories about Jesus going and dying for our... Folks, listen. <clears throat> We're scholars of the Word of God. And we depart that, impart that to others. And he says, so study to show yourself approved unto God. <clears throat> And then there's one other hat I just want to mention in closing. Not only do we wear the hat of a scholar, but we wear, at the end of the day, it's all wrapped up in this one, verse 23 through 26. He says there, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they, that they do um, gender strife. And the servant, underline that word servant, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, <clears throat> instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to acknowledging of the truth. Oh, folks, listen. Paul has called us, or he's challenging Timothy and He's challenging us to be a servant of the Lord Jesus. Jesus saved us out of the world of sin. Again, I want to go back to my introduction. We were, we were conveyed. We were transported. He took us out of a world of darkness, and he brought us over here and put us down in the world of light, established us in the church to be a servant. Folks, there's no greater joy than to serve Jesus and serve others. So Paul said, there are a lot of hats that we wear. 
And he gave some terminology here to describe at least seven of them. <clears throat> and as we serve the Lord, we wear different hats. Some days we're a scholar. Some days we're a farmer. Some days we're a soldier, enduring hardness of things. Some days we're a steward. <clears throat> but as a Christian, every day we're a servant. May the Lord help us to be the best servant we can be, to honor Jesus and to help others. Let's stand together. Uh, Brother Allen is coming to come, the music team. They're going to lead us in the invitation hymn. <clears throat> Maybe God has spoken to your heart through his word this morning to remind us you know, there was a day in my life that I took the gospel and I deposited it faithfully into others, but somewhere along the way, I kind of quit doing that. You need to come to the altar today and say, God, help me to get back on the firing line. Maybe there was a time in your life that you were just a really good soldier of the cross. You endured those hardnesses of things. and You went through them with flying colors. And man, you just like a soldier. You were just after it. Somewhere along the way, you kind of slid to the wayside. Maybe there was a time that you were just rejoicing in being a farmer, sowing those seeds, bringing in that crop. But Lord, I don't get as excited anymore as I once did over crop harvesting. I could go on and on. But there are people here that used to be aflame doing the will and the things of God but you've been sidetracked. So first of all, the invitation is for you. Would you come to the altar today and say, God, help me to return to my first love. And then there's some here today that need to come and pray. Pray for yourself, pray for others, pray for the church, pray for your family, but you need to come and cry out to God. and Say, Lord, would you touch that life? Would you come and stand in the gap, brothers, is what I'm asking you to do. We open the doors of the church in a way Baptists receive members. We invite you to come and plant your life here at Eastside Baptist Church. But as God speaks to your heart, would you obey him? But the greatest thing of all God wants you to do is be saved. If you're lost, come today and be saved. Give your heart to Jesus and he will save your soul. Brother Adam, lead us as we sing. Would you come? God speaking to your heart. Would you obey Word
church today. I trust that you'll have a wonderful afternoon tonight. Uh, we start at 6 p.m. We plan to preach tonight from Acts 22, and I hope you'll be here for our evening service. Um, as we go, let me remind the um, church council that we'll meet at uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon, choir practice, 5 o'clock, and then worship at 6. So wherever your place of service is, please be found faithful and uh, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Are there any other announcements? Yes, Brother Doug. Uh, Denise Gilstrap went on to be with the Lord. Debbie's, uh, <coughs> Debbie's friend. <coughs> 